Financial meltdown on Black Wednesday. Watch out, excuse me. Five years ago today, the government faced one of the biggest financial crises in history. It was incredible. You can hear wave after wave of selling hitting the market. It was a day when the Bank of England lost billions and speculators made fortunes. It was uh, in excess of a, a billion dollars of, of profits. Ever lost 15%. A day of disaster from which the government never recovered. It was quite clear the government was not in charge of events. I had no doubt we were in the middle of the, quite the biggest political crisis that I could remember. Margaret Thatcher put Britain on the road to Black Wednesday. The economy was in crisis, and in her own party, the knives were out for the Prime Minister. Her Chancellor, John Major, suggested a rescue plan. He believed joining the European exchange rate mechanism would be both good for her and the economy. Margaret Thatcher detested the idea of putting the pound into Europe, but most Tory MPs supported it, and she knew years of division had to end. There had been some pretty heated discussions back in 1985, 1986. I remember one famous occasion ending in discord in the cabinet room with Geoffrey Howe storming out and slamming the door, possibly the most decisive thing he ever did. Um, so feelings ran pretty high for a long time. John Major took it all down. He managed to gently persuade her that it was probably right for the economy. There were strong domestic political reasons to do it. And slow, rather like water dripping on a stone, it eventually became not too painful a decision for her to take. It would be a revolution. The pound's value would be locked against the German Deutschmark and other European currencies. It could vary, but only a little. To maintain the pound's value, British interest rates had to match German ones. In theory, the pound would then be stable, equally attractive to investors. Whatever the Germans did to their interest rates, we would have to do the same. The hope, German discipline would give Britain a stable pound, low inflation and German-style prosperity. It was a high-risk strategy Nevertheless, Margaret Thatcher called in her Chancellor and the highest officials. She decided Britain would join the ERM the very next day. The hope was it would boost the Prime Minister's popularity before the Tory party conference in three days' time. This meant going in at the level the pound stood against the Deutschmark then, which was high. Despite the ERM rules, the Prime Minister took the decision without negotiation. Although she was the one who led us in, she did it against her better judgment. And with a bit of defiance, there was no nonsense about consulting the Europeans. Uh, we did it and we alone did it. John Major called me and said, we have decided to join at the rate of 295 D marks. And I said, John, I have to tell you, we have to negotiate that. And I think 295 is a little bit on the high side. And he said, no, we cannot change that because it was decided by the prime minister. And I said, well, I don't care about your prime minister, but I wanted to negotiate that with you. You have to follow the rules. But he said, well, it's too late. We will announce it in half an hour. And after it was announced, of course, there was no room for negotiations anymore. And I, we simply had to accept it and to pray and to hope that this was a realistic rate. For John Major, Britain's entry was a triumph. From the start, this was his policy, and he took the credit. I think everyone's very pleased that Sterling has joined the exchange rate mechanism. I'm very pleased. We've been waiting for this decision for a long time. It's now been made. I think it will be a great success, and I'm looking forward to discussing it with my colleagues. Are you, are you consulted, are you are you are consulted nothing, Mr Major? And I have nothing more to say about it at the moment. But joining the ERM was not enough to save Mrs Thatcher. The victim of a Tory party coup, just seven weeks later, she left Downing Street for the last time. Now it's time for a new chapter to open. 
and I wish John Major all the luck in the world. But joining the ERM failed to bring instant prosperity. Britain had already been sliding into recession. Over the next 18 months, it got much worse. A million people lost their jobs. The high exchange rate of the pound locked inside the ERM meant businesses struggled to sell their goods abroad. The ERM reduced inflation, but there was little sign of German-style wealth. People were finding it very hard to meet their mortgage payments, and when they failed to meet their mortgage payments and, and were obliged to sell their house, we were, for the first time in British post-war history, witnessing people selling houses for less than they'd paid. And that dreadful new word, negative equity, came into the language. It was a very, very hard time. Against the odds, John Major won the 1992 election. He was determined to run the country as before, with the pound locked at the high exchange rate at which it had entered the ERM. He believed if he stood firm, the ERM could make the British economy as successful as Germany's. The Prime Minister said he would come to dinner because the Sunday Times had supported him in the election. He said, you know, Andrew, Prime Ministers have tried to get inflation down and make Britain a low inflation economy. Uh, they've never succeeded. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be the Prime Minister um, that got inflation down and established Britain as a low inflation economy. To which one of our numbers said, yes, but it, uh, this could be the low inflation of the dead. What's the point of having low inflation if the economy is not just on its knees, but on its back? Anybody can do that. An angry Prime Minister said that this was a policy on which he would never give way. The pain was worth it. He thumped the table and said, Andrew, don't you understand? There is no alternative. But the Germans were about to increase the pain. The men who ran Germany's central bank prepared to meet. It wasn't politicians, but the Bundesbank Council who set Germany's interest rates. Whatever they decided, Britain would have to follow. But in Germany, the unthinkable was happening. The economy was faltering. The cost of unification with East Germany was higher than predicted, and inflation was rising. The Bundesbank Council raised interest rates. Our decisions were made on the basis of what is necessary at home. Our primary target in that time was to go on in fighting the acceleration of price increases in our country. Yeah, this is yeah, the Bundesbank's yeah, main target. Inside the ERM, we should in theory have followed Germany's rising interest rates to keep the value of the pound steady but the British government desperately tried to avoid doing this. If we wanted to stay in the ERM, we had to match those interest rates. Um, but if we matched German interest rates, that meant you know, higher interest rates in the UK, hitting the housing market above all, in a way that became increasingly politically and economically unsustainable. In the city, the crisis that would become Black Wednesday was brewing. The currency dealers began to sell pounds and buy Deutschmarks because of the high German interest rates. The pound's value fell towards its bottom limit in the ERM. Rumours spread that the government was about to devalue, locking the pound to the Deutschmark at a lower level. The government frantically tried to restore confidence. Just in case there is the slightest scintilla of doubt, there are going to be no devaluations, no leaving the ERM. We are absolutely committed to the ERM. That is our policy. It is at the centre of our policy. We are going to maintain sterling's parity and we will do whatever is necessary. And I hope there is no room for any doubt about that at all, that the government is determined to maintain our position. John Major's successor as Chancellor had now nailed his colours to the ERM mast. In private, the strain showed. He had inherited a policy which he didn't really very much like, and he would complain in private, and he would have 
spats, periods of bad temper with his officials and with, with all of us. And I think his whole chancellorship um, was an unhappy period um, because he was forced, and I think loyally did, defend a policy that he didn't like. Also, of course, he had endlessly to answer questions about a recession, which was caused by this policy he didn't like. We had a meeting about all of this, and Norman Mont said, well, there is one policy left, and that's to get the Germans to cut their rates. And that's what he set out to do when he went off to Bath. What happened now edged Britain closer to Black Wednesday. Europe's finance ministers and top bankers were gathering. Norman Lamont's mission was to persuade the Bundesbank president to cut German interest rates to help Britain. Chancellor, uh, what about the pound today? A last-minute letter from Germany's leader gave hope. Before Bath, John Major had a very clear indication from Helmut Kohl that, that he, Kohl, would like to see German interest rates come down. And that's the context, of course, for the Bath meeting, and it's very important because what the Chancellor then had to do was see the colour of their money. As Norman Lamont welcomed his guests, they could see he was a Chancellor under pressure. He hoped his European colleagues would back him. It wasn't just Britain that was suffering. The Germans were also forcing the other European countries to keep their interest rates high. Some were finding it hard to bear. There was an air of crisis. When I came to Bas, I and everybody else knew that the situation was very, very difficult. And I was told that the Italians, um, uh, who had just arrived, uh, uh, took the view that something had to be done, otherwise they would have to leave the EIM. Inside the assembly rooms, the Chancellor prepared to do battle. Unlike the Bank of England at that time, the Bundesbank did not take orders from politicians. How he handled its president would be critical. The Chancellor decided to be forthright. The only thing which Mr. Lamont has had in mind was to force the Germans to lower interest rates. And he asked me if I could not yeah, lower the Lombard rate of the Bundesbank yeah, the, next, the next Monday. The way he was uh, speaking and uh, trying to convince the Germans sh uh, show, uh, was showing that uh, he, he felt he was in real uh, political difficulties if, uh, unless he got something out of the discussion. The question was simple. The question was simple. You've got to bring down interest rates. There was no introduction, no conclusion. The questioning was quick, brutal, incisive. But the Bundesbank president would not promise a cut in German interest rates. Four times, Norman Lamont refused to take no for an answer. As a member of the Bundesbank, one is an independent person. One cannot be treated as an employee. It's not possible. One cannot accept it. And I thought, he is not my master. I must bring this exercise to an end. And I said to Finance Minister Weigel on my side, in Bavarian dialect, I think uh, I should go now. The German finance minister restrained a furious Helmut Schlesinger. Then he told Norman Lamont the discussion had to end. He was saying, Norman, look, you can ask us here another time and another time the same question and you will get the same answer. But we are not doing this ten times. <laughs> Norman Lamont's strategy had gone badly wrong. Not only had he failed to gain a cut in German interest rates, he had also antagonized the one man who could help him. It was among the most <laughs> unpleasant meetings, unfortunately, I have participated in. This was a meeting which had created a lot of bad mood uh, and absolutely no results. And uh, this kind of things uh, don't happen uh, um, without implications. And, and the fi financial markets the following days, they, they, they took notice of that. 
Helmut Schlesinger left Bath convinced Britain needed to take urgent action to keep the pound in the ERM. Either increase interest rates or to be prepared for a devaluation in the, the European uh, exchange rate mechanism. No other way? No other way, no. But instead of taking action, the Prime Minister pinned the credibility of his entire government on keeping the pound in the ERM at its existing rate. He ridiculed those who said other policies would be better for Britain. Now we have the inevitable chorus of quack doctors peddling their remedies. I said to him many times, you really are taking a, a big risk for yourself that you'll have to eat these words if you, if you go as far as you do. All my adult life, I've seen British governments driven off their virtuous pursuit of low inflation by market problems or political pressures. I was under no illusions when I took Britain into the exchange rate mechanism. I said at the time that membership was no soft option. The soft option, the devaluer's option, the inflationary option, in my judgment, that would be a betrayal of our future at this moment. And I tell you categorically, that is not the government's policy. But the very next day, events overtook John Major's words. In Rome, the Italian government was trying to prevent the collapse of its entire economy. In London, the dealers, fearing devaluation, jettisoned the Italian lira. The lira's value plummeted. To stop the slide and keep the lira in the ERM, the Bank of Italy poured in money. The Bundesbank did the same. The ERM rules said it had to. One billion dollar was what we were spending in a few hours. And we reached two or three or four or even five. Now this was billion dollars. This was for me at least an astonishing amount of money. As the selling intensified, inside the Bundesbank, its president decided that despite the ERM rules, he could no longer help the Italians. He told the Italians they were on their own. The first silly reaction was, why? <laughs> because at that point you ask why, very politely. And they said, because it's costing too much. We are spending too much and we are not ready to go on indefinitely. The German leader, Helmut Kohl, met with Schlesinger. Schlesinger proposed a deal. To end the crisis, he would cut German interest rates if Italy, Britain and others devalued their currencies. The Prime Minister was visiting the Queen at Balmoral. From there, he flatly rejected the proposal. There would be no devaluation, despite the German offer. This was notified to John by me. He repeated that he felt confident. I insisted. I said to him, John, uh, we need stability. The markets are really in a fighting mood and I do not think that uh, the victory on the lira will be considered satisfactory by them. They will choose new targets. But this did not change his mind. The next morning, the lira was devalued by 7%. The Germans cut their interest rates by a tiny quarter of 1%. Those dealers who had held on to the lira lost fortunes for their clients. Many started to sell pounds. They feared a British devaluation would be next. UK investment funds and indeed pension funds, all of a sudden they can see all these strains building up in Europe and the, the pound is clearly going to come under pressure. They're holding all these pounds and they want to get rid of them because they think the value of the pound is going to go down. So they started selling. In Frankfurt, the president of the Bundesbank gave an interview to a journalist. It only needed a hint that the pound might devalue to provoke an avalanche of selling. Inadvertently, Schlesinger gave that hint. 
Well, he said the realignment was not uh, satisfactory. It was not enough. It was only a small devaluation of the Italian lira. He wished, he wanted to have more, a more comprehensive realignment. Uh, other currencies involved as well. Schlesinger believed his remarks were off the record. Werner Benkoff did not. He prepared to send his story across the world. At the Treasury, Norman Lamont knew nothing of this bombshell. But that day had seen some of the heaviest selling yet of the pound. He and his advisers were already planning their defences. On the Tuesday evening we met for the Chancellor to sanction a sort of a firefighting fund of a billion uh, to defend the pound against speculation and then the word came through that there might be something published next day in which the head of the Bundesbank had indicated that a wider revaluation that might have been helpful. The newspapers were preparing their front pages. I could not say I haven't said this. It, it, it was not true. I, I have said this. But it was certainly not for the public. All evening, the Chancellor and his team pressed the Bundesbank to deny the remarks, but they couldn't. Well, they couldn't say it's not true because I had the tape. It was on my tape, the interview. They couldn't deny it. We were all pretty shocked, and there really wasn't anything very much we could do. And in a way, the meeting, as it were, was adjourned. Uh, and resumed at 8 o'clock next morning, by which time it was clear that, indeed, it had been every bit as bad as we feared. Black Wednesday dawned. We got in to work at 6 o'clock, because Schlesinger had made his comments the night before, and with what happened in the Lira, we were all pretty worried that the pound was going to come under a lot of pressure that day. And so the drama began. The rumours of a devaluation meant that to hold on to sterling was a gamble. Banks, pension funds, international companies told their dealers to sell the pound. And then the speculators joined the fray. George Soros gambled five billion pounds, selling while sterling was still high, but intending to buy back cheaply if the pound devalued and make a fortune. The Bundesbank was basically egging on the speculators to speculate against the weaker currencies. And we took our cue, actually, from the Bundesbank. Get some dollar mark calls going out. I need some cable calls, so I've got to stop loss. The Bank of England hoped it could make George Soros lose his gamble. It planned to sustain the pound's value by buying pounds at the official high ERM rate. Billions of pounds of public money were about to be thrown into the defence of the pound. We decided that as the London market came in, we would intervene uh, on a scale which would make it quite clear that we were intervening, uh, and that's what we did. It was incredible. I mean, obviously you can hear what's going on in the market, and you can hear wave after wave of selling hitting the market, being met with resistance and support by the Bank of England. They were buying such a phenomenal amount of pounds. At the Treasury, they waited for news. We were really just waiting minute by minute updates um, from the market. And that was when we learned that the billion that we had put aside to defend the pound up to the weekend um, on Tuesday night had been, you know, had gone in a few minutes. That was really when the question was posed. Uh, is this it? Is the game up? The bank was extremely grave. Um, they said, we will have to raise interest rates. Um, we can't save the situation by intervention alone. The Prime Minister was living in Admiralty House in Whitehall. Downing Street was being rebuilt after an IRA mortar attack. The Chancellor rang the Prime Minister to say interest rates would have to go up two points. And he wanted the Prime Minister's agreement to that. And this was obviously a very difficult moment for the Prime Minister. For months, John Major had not put up interest rates. Now, after anguished debate, he agreed a rise to 
Prime Minister thought that this interest rate increase was absolutely explosive in terms of its political impact, given the state of the economy, the recession, and particularly the housing market. In the Admiralty House dining room, the Prime Minister met three of his most senior ministers, Michael Heseltine, Douglas Hurd, and Kenneth Clark. He asked them to endorse his decision. We got the message, Douglas Hurd, Michael Heseltine and myself, we were in a sterling crisis, and he wished to put up rates dramatically to show the political will, to defend the value of the pound, to see if it would have the effect of uh, stabilizing it and stopping the flow of uh, our reserves out because we were defending at the time simply by buying sterling as much as we could using our own golden currency reserves. And uh, he got the agreement of the group that we had to raise interest rates, it was necessary, off he went, raised rates by 2%. Anyone want to buy a house? Watch out, excuse me. Intended to show strength, the markets perceived the rate rise as weakness and reacted accordingly. We had a fairly strong sense that we were on to the kill. It indicated to us uh, that uh, we are in uh, the, at the end game, that there was no you know, this was an act of desperation. So instead of restraining us, it was really an invitation uh, to, to, to double up, to try to sell as much more as possible. The Bank of England had some 19 billion pounds in foreign currency reserves, but it was now spending two billion an hour as more and more people sold the pound. And all of a sudden, instead of being asked to quote a price in five million pounds or to sell five million pounds for clients, typically they would come up and do multiples of that. Suddenly they would be coming with an interest in 20 million pounds, 50 million pounds, 100 million pounds, and sometimes even bigger than that. Unaware of all this, the politicians were still hoping the rate rise had worked. I went outside to go back to the Home Office. I was being driven by a Metropolitan Policeman. And we were about halfway down Whitehall when the driver said to me, uh, it hasn't worked, sir, because he'd been listening to the radio. And the radio had been commenting on the market reaction, and he was right. Within 10 minutes, it was obvious it hadn't worked. The run on Sterling was going ahead. I went back to the Home Office, potted about with a bit of work, and, of course, I was back in the Admiralty House within half an hour because the meeting was reconvened. What do we do now? At the Bank of England, the man in charge of defending the pound believed it was time to throw in the towel and stop spending before the bank's reserves were exhausted, even though that would mean letting the pound crash out of the ERM. Well, my view at that stage was that the game was up. The scale of the intervention became heavier after the rise in interest rates because I think there were some people in the market who said that makes no sense in the context of the UK economy. It had become clear that getting out of the RM was, was, was bound to happen and was, you know, the sooner the better. Upstairs in the Prime Minister's temporary flat, the Chancellor broke the grim news. Chancellor went through the options, the Prime Minister went through the options, and it was clear that the Chancellor's option was now to suspend. A critical decision had to be made. The Prime Minister insisted on summoning back his senior ministers. He had no intention of taking the decision to leave the ERM alone. It might destroy his administration. After all, he had made the ERM the cornerstone of the government's credibility. The Prime Minister went downstairs and went through the options very neutrally but describing very clearly what the Chancellor's preferred option was, suspension. I think it came as a shock to some of the colleagues that this policy, the ERM, could end so easily. I could see our economic policy and to some extent our European policy were collapsing. The Chancellor of the Exchequer and the Prime Minister and all of us following them had been emphatic and definite for month after month that this was the centre of our economic policy. 
It also had its importance for our foreign policy. Uh, and therefore, yes, of course, everybody in that room wanted to stay in if we could. A further interest rate rise to defend the pound would be disastrous for the economy, and there was no evidence it would work. Norman Lamont again advocated suspension, but Michael Heseltine, Kenneth Clark and Douglas Hurd disagreed. Most of them wanted to make it clear that we'd gone the final mile to remain within the ERM. There were some people who said, well, are you absolutely confident that if we raise interest rates further, that won't actually persuade the markets? I thought that extremely unlikely, but um, I mean, in those circumstances, if people wanted to try, then that was um, something that one couldn't exclude. It might just work. John Major decided to raise interest rates a second time to 15%. Did anyone think it would work? I don't know if anyone thought it would work. Most of his colleagues, I think, thought it was the right thing to do. What did you think? My thought at the time, I, I was mostly concerned with making sure that what was obviously going to be an extremely dangerous moment for the Prime Minister was that the decision was concluded in a way that had the support of his key ministers. This was such a crisis for the government that apart from the value of our wisdom and opinion, we had to be carried with these dramatic events. You could break up the government. If some senior minister immediately said, well, I never agreed to any of this and this was a terrible folly, uh, put another way, which is the phrase I used, uh, we were there to have our hands dipped in the blood to make it clear this was a collective responsibility at the top of the government. Who asked 15%? 15%! What? What? 15%! Yeah, yeah, yeah. The interest rate market, which was sitting 30 yards away, exploded in noise. We thought, we can't believe it, the Bank of England's raised interest rates again. That was a sign of weakness, not of strength. The more those rates go up, the more it's going to be worse for the pound, isn't it? Mortgage rates, no way. 10 done. There was a very, very small rally in sterling. It went up maybe a third of 1%, a very, very small rally for such a big rise in the interest rates, and immediately settled back on the floor. And the Bank of England was still buying pounds. That afternoon, it became a veritable uh, uh, avalanche of selling. In a sitting room inside Admiralty House, Michael Heseltine, Douglas Hurd, and Kenneth Clark now sat drinking tea, hoping against hope the second interest rate rise would work. It was whilst we were in the sitting room in the afternoon that we suddenly realised that we were probably less well informed than perhaps anybody else in the United Kingdom about exactly what was going on. And so we actually began to search for a transistor radio. We decided that we should try to keep in touch with the money markets. And here we were, cooped up in Admiralty House, uh, three people in the country least well informed about the hour-by-hour -hour movements in the money market which kept being reported to us upon which we were acting. By mid-afternoon, the Bank of England had spent £15 billion. Pounds. It was running out of money with which to defend the pound. 10 minutes 30, 10 minutes 30. Rumours swept the markets that Britain had persuaded Germany to cut its interest rates to relieve the pressure. She says that the Bundesbank may re drop rates by a quarter point again. They're waiting for them to do something. Yeah. But the Bundesbank was not going to take decisions that put the needs of Britain before those of Germany. We 
have the Bundesbank, and we have the Bundesbank law, and, uh, and, and these are German resources. So, you know, uh, to give everyone a free ride is not our, our, our task. Uh, our task is to make possible uh, currency cooperation on uh, rates which the politicians fix, and if they are unsustainable, well, the politicians should change them. The Prime Minister had a series of conversations with the Germans to explore whether they would support Sterling. Getting Helmut Kohl to say yes or no to that was important. But when John Major asked Helmut Kohl for German help, his reaction was non-committal. Reassuring, um, I'll get back to you. Did he get back? Well, let's just say the day moved on. We had no power. The markets and events had taken over. It became increasingly obvious as the day went on that we were merely being flotsam and jetsam being tossed about in what was happening. And then? Then, of course, uh, the decision to suspend was taken. The Prime Minister gathered his colleagues. He told them Britain had no choice but to pull out of the ERM. They knew it was a political catastrophe. The government's credibility would be gravely damaged. Prime Minister was all right. Uh, I mean, he was in the same position as the rest of us that the government was suffering uh, a major calamity and that uh, we found we had not got sufficient control over events and the British government couldn't stop it. No government could stop it when that amount of market sentiment was moving so much money around so quickly and we had an indefensible value of the pound. And John was perfectly in control of himself and in control of the such businesses we could handle throughout the day. The Prime Minister was calm and matter-of-fact, and indeed usually at, in the heart of a crisis, in the very eye of the storm, in my experience, things are calm and quiet. It's before and afterwards that the emotional storms, the nervous storms begin to blow. Keith, I've done the dollar side, I just work the mark there now, right? The government made no announcement, but the Bank of England now withdrew from battle. At four o'clock, suddenly the Bank of England wasn't supporting pounds. Instead of a load of noise coming out of the voice brokers and everything and around the dealing room, everyone just sat in stunned silence for about two seconds or three seconds, and all of a sudden it erupted and Sterling just free fell. That sense of awe that the markets could take on a central bank and actually win, I couldn't believe it. So how many pounds have you sold? About half a billion. Half a billion. So has it been good business? Yeah, it's been really good. Yeah. What, what does that mean to the bank here? Um, we've had a, an excellent day. We've made a lot of money. So it's good. What are we talking about? A couple of hundred thousand pounds? Uh, probably about ten million. Very up for the pair. The markets finally closed, and dealers still didn't know that the momentous decision to leave the ERM had been taken. For three and a half hours, there was silence from the government. Treasury officials advised the Chancellor he shouldn't speak until a meeting was convened in Brussels with Britain's partners in the ERM. I'd never previously been in a government that hadn't got an economic policy. It's a, a weakness in, um, in a government's um, position. Uh, I had never encountered a situation where, in that situation, the ministers, the political leaders of the government, are accepting. They can't tell the public anything about it. When it's all over the newspapers, every tenth-rate economic pundit in the country is in front of cameras explaining what he thinks is happening. Most of the reporting is coming from people who haven't the first idea what's going on, and the sense of hysteria and panic is no doubt spreading through the nation. We had just put up interest rates by a most phenomenal amount in one day, and nobody was saying anything. the Prime Minister was reluctant to allow any government minister to speak. Instead, the Conservative Party chairman was summoned. People did not want um, there to be any more 
uh, detailed questioning of what the next steps would be and what the consequences were and so on and so forth. And clearly it was easier in some ways to, to put the, the party chairman up. Um, he obviously couldn't be drawn to, to comment on any of the detailed um, economic consequences and what the next steps might be. As I came in, Michael and Douglas and Ken put up this sort of low cheer and I thought this was very odd. What are, what are they cheering about? What then became evident of what they were cheering about was that it had been decided that although uh, we, the decision had been, going, had been taken to go out of the ERM, um, that it was going to be myself who was going to appear on television that evening to explain it. And this rather kind of bizarre explanation was that there was this funny body called the Monetary Committee, who, frankly, I'd never heard of, and I'm sure 99 people out of 100 had never heard of, which uh, sat in Brussels. And it was a group of officials who actually uh, had to accept the resignation. It was sort of like a club, you know. You had to accept the resignation before it was official. So Norman Lamont had taken the view, well, if that's the case, I can't uh, actually appear on television uh, and uh, answer questions until it's official. And if he couldn't appear, no other government minister could appear. So there was Fowler, party chairman, not in the government, absolute godsend. That's why they were cheering. By this time, again, people like Michael Heseltine and myself were getting pretty fed up with the completely ridiculous politics of this. This is no way for a government to handle uh, the media or to handle the, uh, the, the explanation of such a serious decision. Uh, we managed to get reluctant agreement. I mean, I would just go out and give interviews personally. But we got reluctant agreement from the um, whole gathering that Norman Lamont could go out, give a slightly forced and artificial short statement, say thank you very much and come straight back inside as long as he didn't answer questions. Um, this was a fair old fiasco and added to the sense of um, uh, no doubt unreal drama to the outside world. Today has been an extremely difficult and turbulent day. Massive speculative flows have continued to disrupt the functioning of exchange rate mechanism. As chairman of the Council of European Finance Ministers, I have called a meeting of the Monetary Committee in Brussels urgently tonight to consider how stability can be restored to the foreign exchange markets. In the meantime, the government has concluded that Britain's best interests are served by suspending our membership of the exchange rate mechanism. As a result, the second of the two interest rate increases that I sanction today will not take place tomorrow, and minimum lending rate will be at 12% until conditions become calmer. I will be reporting to Cabinet, discussing the situation with colleagues tomorrow, and may make further statements then. But until then, I have nothing further to say. Thank you very much. Mr. Lamont, what about those in your party that are calling for your resignation? Mr. Fowler, it's difficult to see this as anything other than a defeat and humiliation for the government and a blow to the credibility of the Prime Minister, is it? No, I don't think it's uh, any of those things. I think the fact of the matter is that the government has had to respond to quite an exception. The Prime Minister telephoned Fleet Street editors. He was about to discover old allies had become enemies. It was 7.30 on Wednesday evening. My secretary came to, to get me to tell me that the Prime Minister was on the line. Now, that's a sort of an unusual thing to happen, even, even in a busy tabloid office. And I couldn't, for the life of me, think what he wanted to talk about. We were up to our neck in God knows what, and the Prime Minister mysteriously can find a couple of minutes to come and chat to a, you know, a tabloid tosspot. So, um, I pick up the phone and he says, Hello, Kelvin, how are you? And uh, I said, fine, Prime Minister, how are you? And we, we swap a bit of chit-chat, and he says, um, how are you going to play today? And so I acted slightly dumb, and I said, um, in what sense, what do you mean? He said, well, the big story, how, how are you going to play that? I said, well, <clears throat> I have on my desk, Prime Minister, a great big bucket of shit. He went, uh, oh, yes. And I said, I intend to pour it all over you tomorrow. And there's a sort of a pause the other end. And then he says, Oh, you are a wag. John Major considered resigning. 
but didn't. Neither did Norman Lamont. I recall calling the Treasury on the day after Black Wednesday and saying I'd like to see the Chancellor. Much to my surprise, at about six o'clock, I was called over, ushered into the Chancellor's rather grand room in the Treasury. He opened a bottle of white wine. We sat. He seemed incredibly relaxed. And I said, how do you feel of this terrible event? And he basically said, I feel fine. In fact, I haven't slept so well in for months. Last night, I didn't have to worry about the value of the pound. And it was extraordinary. Here was a policy that had been reduced to ashes at huge expense. And the Chancellor was saying the government would set another economic policy which put Britain's interests first. During Black Wednesday, the Bank of England lost between three to four billion pounds of public money, trying to keep the pound inside the ERM. The day had been an utter fiasco as interest rates were going up and down like a whore's drawers. The Prime Minister and the Chancellor are like the Chief Executive and the Finance Director of a, of a public company. They sit there and decide the big issues. And on this particular issue, they got it hopelessly and completely wrong. If they... You might think it's an easy life being a well-dressed global explorer. Only 440 quid.